Hi, thank you. It's now a hundred years since drugs were first banned in the US and Britain. And that means for, for a century now, we've been told a very specific story, a very particular story about both drug users and drug addicts. We've been told that they're morally flawed people who can and should be stopped by the threat of punishment. And as this centenary got closer and I realized it was coming up about three years ago, a bit more, I had a quite uh, personal reason to want to think more about it. One of my earliest memories is of trying to wake up one of my relatives and, and not being able to. And as I got older, I realized there was, you know, drug addiction in my family. And I think like a lot of people with this background, and there'll be people in this room who have had similar experiences, I got into a relationship with someone who had a, an addiction problem as well. And I noticed something a bit strange about myself, which is... In my public persona as a newspaper columnist, I argued very strongly for ending the war on drugs and for compassion for addicts. But when I was confronted with the addicts in my own life, not all the time, but a lot of the time, I was really angry. And I was a bit of a drug warrior. <laughs> and I think one of the reasons why the debate about the war on drugs is so charged is because it's something that runs through all of our hearts. Actually, it's very hard to find a person, particularly someone with addicts in their life, who doesn't both have compassion and anger towards addicts. And I, what I wanted to do was to go on a, on a journey to answer lots of questions, but one of them was to see if I could resolve this conflict in myself and for other people. And it took me to meet loads of people. I you know, went across 30,000 miles. I met you know, from a, a transsexual crack dealer in Brooklyn to the only female chain gang in the world in Arizona to a man who spends a lot of time feeding hallucinogens to mongooses to see what happens. It turns out they do like them, but in very specific circumstances. And um, <clears throat> to the only country to ever decriminalize all drugs from cannabis to crack with incredible results. But what I would like to talk to you about tonight are just two stories about two specific people. One is from the beginning of the war on drugs and one is from the beginning of the end of the war on drugs. <clears throat> in 1939, Billie Holiday stood on stage in New York City and she sang a song called Strange Fruit. Most people here will know it. It's a lament against lynching. And as her goddaughter Lorraine Feather told me, you have to understand how shocking this was, right? She's standing in a hotel where she wasn't even allowed to walk through the front door. She had to go through the service elevator because she was an African-American. And she stands up there at a time when all the pop songs are twee love melodies and she sings a rage against lynching. And that night, as her biographer Julia Blackburn records, she was contacted by the Federal Bureau of Narcotics and she was told to stop singing that song. The, the guy who ran the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, Harry Anslinger, was driven really by two rages, the rages that created the war on drugs. One was a rage against addicts and one was a rage against black people. He was regarded as a kind of crazy racist, even by the racists at the time. And Billie Holiday had grown up in a place that was known as Pigtown, which gives you some sense of what it was like. It was a part of Baltimore when Baltimore was the only city in America that didn't have a sewage system. So she grew up with the smell of burning shit all around her. And there were lots of stores she wasn't allowed into because she was an African-American kid. And Billie Holiday had made herself a promise back in Pigtown. She promised herself she would never bow her head to any white man. So when she got told to stop singing her song, she said no. Now, Billie Holiday had a problem. When she was a little girl, when she was, I think she was 11, she was, she was raped. And the man who raped her was punished, but she was punished for a longer period. She was sent to a, they said she was a child prostitute and sent her to a reformatory. Horrendous reformatory. The nuns decided to teach her a lesson by uh, locking her in with dead bodies overnight. And when Billie Holiday managed to escape from there, she went to try to find her mother in Harlem, who was working in a brothel, and Billie Holiday became a child prostitute. When the police found her, they punished her again by sending her to prison. And Billie Holiday needed to stun her grief and her pain, the pain that comes from that kind of childhood. And so she turned to first alcohol and then heroin. When the Narcotics Bureau came for her because she refused to stop singing the song, the first agent they sent was a guy called Jimmy Fletcher, who was a fascinating man. Harry Anslinger hated employing black, pe uh, employing black people because he was such a racist, but he couldn't really send a white guy into Harlem. Jimmy Fletcher tracked Billie Holiday for two years. He danced with her, he followed her, he saw everything she did and he fell in love with her because she was so amazing. 
And all his life, he felt ashamed for what he did. He busted her. She was put on trial. She said at the time, um, it was called the United States versus Billie Holiday, and that's how it felt. When she got out, she wasn't allowed to perform anywhere because she needed a license to perform anywhere where alcohol was sold. Her friend Yolanda Bavan said to me, what's the cruelest thing you can do to a person? It's to take away the thing they love. And when Billie Holiday collapses in her early 40s, she's got liver cancer, she was an alcoholic, she was a heroin addict, they take her to hospital, and the hospital turned her away because she was an addict. They take her to another hospital, and Harry Anslinger and the Federal Bureau of Narcotics were not finished with, with Billie Holiday. She said to one of her friends, they're going to kill me in there, don't let them kill me, they're going to kill me in there. They hand, had they, she had liver cancer, she was dying, they handcuff her to the bed. They take away all her flowers, all her records, they take away everything. They uh, harass her, they terrify her. One of her, she goes into withdrawal because she hasn't got any heroin in the hospital, obviously. And one of her friends, Maylee Dufty, manages to get her some methadone, a methadone prescribed. And Billie Holiday starts to get a little bit better, the withdrawal goes away. 10 days later, they cut off the methadone, she dies. Uh, one of her friends told the BBC it looked like she had been violently wrenched from life. But here's the thing about Billie Holiday. She kept her promise. She always sang her song. She went all over the South, anywhere she could get where they would let her sing. She sang her song against lynching, and she never bowed her head to any white man. Her friend Annie Ross said to me, Billie Holiday wasn't weak. Billie Holiday was as strong as she could be. 40 years later, on the downtown east side of Vancouver, a homeless street addict called Bud Osborne was watching his friends die all around him. But the downtown east side, some people here who know it, it's got the highest concentration of addicts in North America. It's the place at the end of the line in the city at the end of the line. They call it Terminal City. And what was happening is addicts would shoot up behind dumpsters because you don't want the police to see you. And you don't want them to, you know, you don't want to be spotted using smack. But obviously, if you use behind a dumpster and the police can't see you, if you start to OD, no one else can see you. And so you die. And the overdose rate was horrendous. And Bud, who was a homeless street addict, let's remember, said, I have to do something. But what can I do? I'm just a homeless junkie. But he promised himself he would do something. And Bud had an idea. He said to a load of the other addicts, why don't we just start patrolling the alleyways? We'll all agree. We'll have a few bit of time when we're not using, because everyone has time when they're not using. We'll just patrol the alleyways. And when we spot someone ODing, we'll call an ambulance. And they did it. And it goes on for six months, and something amazing happened. The overdose rate fell really dramatically. And that was good in itself, but also the addicts started to think, oh, maybe we're not the pieces of shit that everyone says we are. Maybe we've got some agency. Maybe we can do something. So they started going to these public meetings they'd have about the menace of the addicts, right? And they'd sit at the back. And after a little while, Bud would put his hand up and go, I think you're talking about us. Is there anything we could do differently? And sometimes people would be very angry and contemptuous. Sometimes they'd be puzzled. But they said, well, you leave these needles lying around. And Bud said, that's fine. At the end of the patrol, we'll go and collect the needles. And they did. And then Bud learned that in Frankfurt, in Germany, they'd opened legal injecting rooms for addicts to go and use and be monitored by doctors. And so Bud and his friends, this group of addicts, and there was quite a lot of them, started stalking the mayor of Vancouver, Philip Owen, with a coffin. Everywhere he went, they carried a coffin. And the coffin said on it, when will you open a legal injecting room, Philip Owen? When will you stop people going into this coffin? And Philip Owen was like, a, how would you explain him? Mitt Romney? Like, he was a kind of right-wing businessman, you know, from a very rich family, just didn't have a clue. And for two years, they stalk him, and they start to despair. And one day, Philip Owen just says, who the fuck are these people? So he goes down incognito, he goes to the downtown east side, and he spends a week just talking to addicts. And to his eternal credit, Philip Owen is blown away. He says, I had no idea their lives were like this. And Philip Owen holds a press conference, and he has the chief of the police and the coroner and a load of addicts. And he says, I'm going to open a safe injecting room, the first safe injecting room in North America. We're going to have the most compassionate policy for drug addicts in the whole of this continent. And Philip Owen opens it, and his own party deselects him because they're so appalled, and he loses the mayoralty, but he's replaced by a more left-wing candidate who does support it. More than a decade later, the results are in. The average life expectancy on the downtown east side has improved by 10 years, and the overdose rate has fallen by 80, 80%. You don't get improvements in mortality stats like that, except at the end of a war, which is what this is. Philip Owen told me, you know, when I met him in the downtown east side, people stopped us to thank him, and he told me it was the proudest thing he ever did. Bud died last year. Um, he was in his, only in his early 60s, but, you know, a life as a street addict in the middle of a drug war takes a toll on you. And when he died, 
they sealed off the streets of the downtown east side where he had once lived as a homeless addict. And they had a huge memorial. And there were loads of people in that crowd who knew that they were alive because of what Bud had started at the start of this century. And I guess one of the things I wanted to say is, if you don't care about drug users, you don't care about drug addicts. I think there's something we can learn from Bud and from Billy. We all feel powerless sometimes. We all feel like we can't make a difference. And next time you think that, I want you to think about Billy and Bud. Right now, all over the world, there are people listening to Billie Holiday and feeling stronger because she didn't stop no matter what they did to her. And Bud was a homeless street addict. It's hard to think of a more disempowered person in our society. And what did he do? He transformed his city. He transformed his country because of what he started. The Canadian Supreme Court has ruled that addicts have a right to life and a right to an injecting room, and no one will ever be able to take that away. Because if you've got nothing else, if you've got nothing else, you've got a voice. You've got a human voice. <clears throat> that you can use to persuade people, to appeal to their empathy, to show them that you're human. For 100 years, we've pursued a policy that says at some level that addicts are worth less than us and that they need to be punished out of their condition. You know, when Bud started his uprising in Vancouver, there were a lot of people who said, why do we want these people to survive? If they die, good. A police officer was famously quoted as saying, I wouldn't piss on them if they were on fire. That's the attitude we've been had. You know, it's been a, a very uh, successful hashtag at the moment, Black Lives Matter, about the reaction to the unpunished killings of African Americans in the United States. I would like to propose the hashtag, Addicts Lives Matter. Addicts Lives Matter. Bud's life mattered. Billie Holiday's life mattered. In Arizona, I followed the story of a woman who was cooked in a cage in a prison because she was an addict, and no one was ever punished because no one cared because she was an addict, and that is quite typical. And... When I, when I came home after this long journey and learning about all these people, I didn't feel angry anymore when I looked at the addicts in my life. I, I started to see traces of Billy and Bud in them and I started to see the, the heroism of surviving and keeping going when you're in agony. And I also saw that the path out of addiction can only ever come through love, not through rage and anger. And I promised them that, you know, clean or high, whether, they, you know, whether they're ill or whatever, I would always sit with them and try to love them and not be angry. And I guess if you think about the promise that Billie Holiday and Bud Osborne made, I'd like to ask all of you to make a promise, and don't worry, it's not to buy my book. I would like to, I'd like to ask you to make a promise that if there are addicts in your life, that you will remember and discipline yourself to remember that they're human beings, and although they are maybe unbearable at times, they deserve our compassion and care, and that's the only way we'll ever get them through this. I think what I learned most is that for 100 years, we've been singing war songs all about, about addicts, and all along, we should have been singing love songs to them. Thank you.